Hello everybody, welcome to Microbiology Journal Club. I'm Fazal M, this is my co-host Danny Chan, and we're here to talk about the Chadox NCOV-19 vaccine in rhesus macaques. Yes, and it's um, it, this is a, an allusion to our last episode, right? <laughs> yes. Where we talked about remdesivir in rhesus macaques. Yes. And last week we briefly spoke that I, I had heard about this paper um, again when I was listening to This Week in Virology, and it's like the same principal investigator, this Rocky Mountain labor yeah. laboratory. Um, they have the the funding structure and the the types of investigators and the facilities in order to do this type of infectious disease work um, with non-human primates. <laughs> yeah, and it, yeah. I mean it's a, yeah because again there aren't many labs I mean, now these days. The amount of people working with non-human primates has decreased a lot, and also the ones that do like infectious disease work and that work at the same time also is, and and again they they've also got access to the uh so uh the uh <laughs> covid19 how can i forget covid19 it's everywhere yes um, yes yes <laughs> yeah the novel coronavirus yeah no because i mean um i was gonna well we'll probably get into this as we dive into the figures but what i liked about this paper was they were able to actually use the virus itself in the assays when they were looking at the antibodies yeah. right like this wasn't just like does the do the antibodies bind to these antigens they do that but also yeah. <laughs> do they do anything to the virus itself and you know that's you can't do that without the right um biosafety yeah because <laughs> yeah. you don't want to be handling that virus uh without being able to uh, prevent uh spread in the community <laughs> and also to your employees yeah very <laughs> very very important uh <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you don't want to basically have outbreak occur. The the film outbreak. No, nobody yeah. wants to be Kevin Spacey in outbreak in that circumstances. So <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, so yeah, this is an interesting paper because it also has been quite controversial in the media because some people have been saying, well, does it work? Does it does, whether the study supports whether the vaccine works or not? So this, this is quite. This is why I thought it's quite an interesting one to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and once again, it's a we're looking we're in preprint territory, um, yeah. so that means it hasn't been officially pre peer reviewed. Um, you know, the probably it's been sent out to it might have been sent out already to editors. Yeah. Right? It could be sitting in an inbox somewhere, or maybe it's out for review at the moment. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> basically it's like the yeah this is research in quotation marks. Just I mean. The thing is, it's because it's got such a good pedigree. It's, it is being treated as if it's peer reviewed because it's got quite a lot of like big good people behind it. So people almost are willing to give it to the benefit of the doubt. So mm -hmm. or at least willing to like criticize it themselves. So yeah, and yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that that's I mean that's like the funny you know this idea of peer review and, and like we're part of this process, right? We we've spoken about many yeah. times that like simply reading the papers and diving into that. Um, diving into the figures and criticizing the data, that is the process of peer review. I mean, yeah. everyone has different, um, uh, everyone different education backgrounds, like moving into this. And of course, some are like much more valuable than others, like in terms of formulating arguments against a paper. But that doesn't mean that uh, people, anyone can't just go in and, you know, try to try to figure out what's going on here. <clears throat> uh yeah oh and i guess uh what's also interesting and so much research has come out right in preprints right like this is a great way for scientists to communicate to like a wider audience like instead of just like emailing your friends the paper yeah you can put it up on a server and tag it with the right metadata so you know scientists you may never have for for an investigator like someone that you may never have worked with before like they could find your work right and they mm -hmm. could contact you separately right and build off that work i think that that's an important part of the preprint world as well right it's like it's a glimpse into the dialogue that could have been happening in email threads right i mean but now like a little bit more um accessible to everybody yeah uh i mean uh do something sorry I've, uh yeah so i mean this uh yeah it's been quite interesting because i think the thing that we have to think about when th this paper is like New, uh, whether it like because i think the one of the controversies is about whether it, it does or does not cause pneumonia or and i think we, we might want to talk a little bit about the kind of models prevent, that we use yeah so prevent them in pneumonia yeah because yeah. again like it's quite difficult to actually when you're modeling pneumonia in animals it's quite difficult to 
to judge whether it's similar to the human disease or not and how you define it depends on like what you want to how you want it to be reflected in in humans um, yeah and yeah so i mean we we should talk we should say that animal models right are models mm -hmm. <laughs> not always they're not like 100 percent the reality right of uh of human disease but they're used because um it, it uh, without putting human well, ethically right without putting humans through the ringer and trying to figure out like whether or not something works you're trying it out in these animal models first um and it's important to remember that it's not the disease itself but you do want to see some evidence that it matches up to um to disease that you'd see um well they don't actually so i guess backing up uh they look at um they they've done an infection there's an infectious disease model in rhesus macaques right that's the group that links yes. the remdesivir study to this one um so that's using the non-human primates and that's infecting them with virus and seeing something that looks like disease <laughs> Um, and, and that's a paper that we talked about when we first looked at the remdesivir study, because in order to go and test something like, does this intervention work, you need to just see like what the infection looks like in the animal in the absence of any interventions. Yeah. And, it's, <clears throat> and, uh, and like they, they use an interesting, uh, mouse model where they, uh, cause they, they actually, something that they, they do that's quite interesting is they use two different strains of mice, which seems... Uh, so uh, they they used BALB-C and CD1 mice. So, so mm -hmm. this is something that like I used to do when I was like starting out. So in fact, I think, so now I've sorted out the figures. I I was sorry. The reason I was really quiet there was because suddenly I realized I need to do some things with the figures. So uh, sure. So we can bring up uh, the the first one. So figure. figure yeah, one. yeah. So d yeah, d diving into the paper, yeah. they don't actually start with the rhesus macaque model. Mm. They're actually first looking at. Um, uh, mouse models yes. and so that that makes sense of the progression of doing research as well because you know even going into monkeys is an expensive and <laughs> um sort of like it needs a lot of paperwork right you have to make sure those monkeys are being treated correctly they're more expensive animals and so you don't want to necessarily just do your first thing in monkeys yeah um, you want to fail fast and you want to fail in mice before you go into to monkeys basically right right but i think um what but but what we don't have at this moment, or at least this paper never dives into it, and I think it's quite, it's only coming along now, is that there's no mouse model of disease. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, there's not like a, I mean, there's, there, I think there are maybe, I think there's some inkling of it now well, that there's maybe a humanized mouse of, of yeah, some sort. Literally, I read a press release this morning of some, of a group that released a humanized mouse model that has the ACE2 protein expressed on it. To right, produce a, right. But that wasn't used in this, so you know, we don't yeah. know whether this would actually equate to a human-like disease or not. So right, well, they don't even look at disease, right? Like because yeah. at this point when they did the study, there wasn't a way of like showing like, oh, these are mice getting sick. But what we can look at in the mice is we can just see do they make an immune response, yeah. <laughs> right? And so again, like that's that idea of the model where it's, I mean, you know, you definitely know this already, but like uh, for the viewers out there, that's the idea of the model where um, like you want to see uh, some correlate between humans and, and the animal model. And in this sense, they're just looking at um, TH1, TH2 response, making cytokines, making antibodies, right? And that's, that's the idea, right? Yeah. Like um, we have antibodies, we have T cells, yes. mice have antibodies, mice have T cells. Yeah. If we see some, if we see some change in the way that mice do it, okay, that's that's a little bit of information we can now maybe move to another step because yeah, <laughs> we can push that i mean the next, into the next step. yeah because it's very very difficult to actually model a, pe a an immune system in a petri dish because the immune the way the immune system works it's like almost impossible to generate responses because you have to work mm -hmm. with billions and billions of cells that all are, these different all... cell types tissue yeah. they're separated in different ways right yeah they're moving through the blood they're inside of the lymphatic system like you don't have that in a dish, so... Yeah, it's <laughs> nearly impossible, which is why they use mice. And what they did was they did... Uh, so they extracted splenic T-cells, so, so they took some, out some T-cells to see whether they responded to the uh, yeah, uh, blah, 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 peptides uh, from the spike. So, yep. and so that's 1D, right? 
You're talking about one. That's one D. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. So, because uh, <clears throat> one A is looking at IgG uh, against uh, S1 and S2. Uh, uh, B is the number amount of neutralizing virus type. So, oh, wait, we, we should talk about we should talk about what this vaccine is maybe first. Yes, of course. <laughs> what, oh, is, what, is, what is what is what is Shadox? Shadox. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah. So first, so the first thing they're doing is they're testing their vaccine in mice. We were just explained that it's kind of like a progression. But w what the hell is Shadox? <laughs> yeah. So chimpanzee adenovirus uh, vaccine, great made made noxus that pre presents the spike protein of the uh, uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, uh, and and co cov um yeah yeah i keep forgetting the name i'm i'm having a bad day about this. Uh, <laughs> but yeah that's a protein uh, that does all the kind of terrible things that, i mean we, we have talked about that a fair bit before uh, at least yeah because it was the same it was the same protein it's the spike protein it's a very common antigen people are looking at same one that was used in the dna vaccine yes. strategy right that we talked about maybe two episodes ago um so yeah so that's spike yeah. protein we know that it um it's the receptor, right? Uh, it binds to the cellular receptor and it uh, allows entry. That's the reason it exists. It's oh, yeah. on the surface of the virus. That's why people think it's a good target because if you could block it attaching to things and getting in, then you could block the infection. Um, the antigens on the outside, that's yep. why it's a good version. Um, chimpanzee adenovirus because uh, there's also... There, Actually, the, there's a long history of using adenovirus as a way of getting. So, uh, wait, 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 what's the best way to say? Okay, so in the in the DNA vaccine one that we talked about, yep. we talked about um, trying to get the that vector to make the spike protein inside of cells. Yes, <laughs> and they use tiny needles and electric electricity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, you know, we, the the adenovirus it, the viruses naturally do that thing without having to do electroporation so adenovirus yeah. is able to put the genome in the cells without you get, having to be electrocuted which is why yes. people have been <laughs> so but both yeah. of these vaccines are wasted to deliver the spike protein antigens into cells in a way that will allow them to be presented as something the the immune response will kind of respond to and right. so, so the, the payload is still dna basically right yeah. like we're making whatever cells get either infected by this adenovirus or electrocuted by electricity it's getting dna into those cells yeah. um so the cells themselves will start making this spike protein yeah uh, yeah and the adenovirus was chosen because it's, it's supposed to be benign it's not supposed to be like so that it won't cause a, a disease in itself or just deliver the, the the dna and then not do much else we just want it to yeah. give up after that happens yeah. Yeah, well, they actually, they specifically use replication deficient versions of adenovirus. Yes. So, like, the idea is that the virus that goes in, it can't make more of itself. It's purely there as, like, the shell to deliver the DNA into into the into the body. Yeah. Um, and this is from, and chimpanzee, because actually uh, there's a longer history of working with human adenovirus as a way to get things in. Because, you know, like, it causes very mild diseases, and people said, wow, this if we made it replication deficient, this would be a great way to get cells in yeah. or get DNA in. But the issue with the human adenovirus is that, well, because it does infect humans, a lot of people are already immune to it. Yeah. So, and so if you're immune to the thing that is trying to deliver the DNA, <laughs> yeah. like uh, you won't be able to deliver that. Yeah, those um, little but packages will be all cleared out by the immune system before they can deliver their DNA, which is yeah. not good. Yeah, and, and I want to say that, you know, there's so many vaccines going on right now. It's actually the human adenovirus, that's already that's already gone through phase one trials, mm. right? And actually it showed promising safety. But of course, you know, this idea of like down the line, if you scale up production of that vaccine and a certain percentage of the population is immune, they're just not going <laughs> to, they're going to get no benefit from that vaccine. Yeah. Um, so so Chadox is um, an attempt to find a new virus. Uh, I think they originally did it for influenza. Um, and then they did a MERS paper, which is why they have this one. Um, yeah, and so basically an adenovirus for chimpanzees, humans haven't seen it before. We're unlikely to have an immune response to it. A good way to get DNA into the cells to make spike protein yeah. that will then help us uh, defend against the, in, the infection of another virus, um, but the one that's causing our disease. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and 
so they and this oh yeah so now we've actually explained the, the what the vaccine is now we can just go into the data we've got <laughs> i think so yeah yeah There's, i think so i think so <laughs> yeah and yeah they use so BALBC mice are very inbred and cd1 mice are, tend to be outbred so what does that mean that means uh, uh one is very genetically diverse and one's very like kind of a monoculture so one thing that that happens in like research is that we do kind of use a lot of inbred strains and the problem is that that genetic like kind of bottlenecking means that they can behave very differently to vaccines and to other things yeah yeah i read that um for inbred lions i, I think there wikipedia is something like 20 20 line right 20 like generations but the idea is that they've bred in they've been bred together so many times that many of their loci are fixed yes. so they're basically clones they're not yeah. really clones but like they're so <laughs> they've had so many interbreedings that everything mo very clone like <laughs> Yeah. Um, but of course, human like in real populations, we're not like that at all, right? No, like, we're... not all of our lo <laughs> our loci are not all fixed <laughs> homogeneously throughout yeah. the population. Yeah. Even in like the <laughs> even in like the worst stereotypes of like inbred human cultures, they're not as bad as like these mice. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and that that's why like you'll see the the blue dots which are represent data points are always much more spread out because the the outbred mice have a lot more variance in how they're going to respond so it's yeah. kind of important to test things in outbred and inbred <laughs> so inbred kind of is where you test a proof of concept and then outbred is like comes the next stage where you like take that to see whether i mean will this vaccine work so we won't know that this vaccine works for this strain of mouse but will it work for all mice so it's almost like <laughs> you have to make sure the vaccine works in mice before we figure out whether it can work in populations of other animals. Yeah, absolutely. I, I actually think um, this is so, this, this comparison between these two models, you know, I really like the inclusion of this, right? Because they're really trying to cover their bases, yeah. right? And give us like a, a better picture of what's going on. Like they know that models have their limitations, yeah. <laughs> right? And like, even in so much as the limitations in the model itself, like not even saying mouse has a limitation against comparing to humans, but just like mouse immune systems are different, yeah. right? And like, if we want the best knowledge about how this immune system works, let's look at, you know, standard laboratory immune system, bulb C, right? Yeah. Versus outbred CD1, right? With a lot more variation. If we see good response from both, then again, there's that little bit of evidence, not, it's not yeah. like the bet, it's not like, the most compelling but it's that small amount that says you know this works regardless of in a variety of genetic backgrounds in a variety yeah. of types of immune systems yeah <clears throat> again like very subtle differences right like yeah. is what is what that's showing i, I mean so it, yeah oh go sorry ahead. i was going like in some cases it can be quite big differences i remember during my phd i, I was working with multiple strains of mice and cd ones would have massive differences some some days that you'd have get experiments where they are super susceptible and some so yeah, that was just my gripe about that. Um, is, is CD is CD one always an outbred line? Yeah, the so they, so I mean they're basically like I think they're usually called Swiss mice. So they've been going around for like like a uh, hundred a hundred years or so. They try to keep that kind of outbred. Whereas Balb C, like uh, that's been to the point where you you can if you buy it from different suppliers, you can sometimes get different reactions from from some of these mouse mouse strains. So. It's... Oh yeah, yeah. Because I yeah, I've seen that like the Balb C that they have that slash C and then sometimes a whole bunch of other letters yeah, come so after like, that. You, right? yeah, you, you can <laughs> track the entire history of this like genealogy of some strains by like I mean it's, it's sometimes fascinating when you like can look at paper like from fifty years ago and they come up with like results and then every strain that comes yeah, so it's Yeah, you would know how the strain that you have now currently relates to strains from the past yeah and that's <laughs> yeah. uh kind of very necessary if you want to like check out your experience anyway uh so yeah so they basically like... so they see they see a response both so in eliza's that's for antibodies yep. against uh spike protein engines they see the, a similar response for both um yep. compare like they have an empty vector chadox is what they're using yep um so just a... one that doesn't contain the spike protein yep <clears throat> yeah, so. uh, and then VN titer. So this is where I was saying, like, I, I love that they get to actually work with the virus, mm. right? So yeah. like VN titer is they have they have the SARS coronavirus because they're going to use it to infect these animals anyways. So now they can take the take the serum from those animals, uh, incubate it yeah. with that virus, and then see can that virus still infect cells? And the idea is that if the serum has something that can bind those viral particles in a certain way you're seeing a real functional readout you yeah. know of that that antibody's activity 
So yeah, that actually <clears throat> means something because you know if it if it just hits the protein, you don't know whether it's stopping it or not. So yeah, yeah, and again, and you know, this is a, with all science. There's limitations that like okay, so but this is <laughs> with a certain amount of serum right on infecting a certain type of cell, right? Um, they think they use Vero cells, right, yep. as their their placking. Yeah, Vero cells from um, the African green monkey. If <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Oh yeah, and I I shared this, or I think I maybe I shared it after when we talked last time. But in this week in virology, you know, the question was brought: Why rhesus macaques when people use green monkeys, like to, green monkey cells, as the mm. basis for all these cellular assays? And the answer from the investigator was just that, like, they're thought to be kind of similar, and in terms of sourcing the monkeys, it was easier to source rhesus macaques in the U.S. at that time because Vera monkeys, I guess, come through China and, like, there's some supply chain business. So <clears throat> um, so then in C, they're looking at... Uh, we, and we've seen this assay before, the Ellie spot assay. Yes. Um, they scoop so, out some, like, T cells from the spleen uh, mm -hmm. and then see whether they, like, they respond to the antigen or not. So they kind of... <clears throat> Yeah, um, and it seems like they 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 because you can tell when like T cells are pissed off because they go like oh look they just spout out inter interferon gamma when they see what yes. something they don't re something they recognize yeah. is awful and so that seems like that seems uh, like they got reaction and, and and we've said it before that interferon gamma is one of those classic um, responses done uh, to viral infection right yes. that like that cytokine is thought to sort of. Uh, not sort of. It's thought <laughs> to induce like a set of genes, interferon stimulating genes, right, that have a variety of antiviral effects. So, yes. I mean, it's just one of many different cytokines, but it's thought of one of the more important ones for viral infection. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, then they look into like the amount of the T cell proportions in, in uh, oh, the, so like whether the, so, um, on whether they react on what they produce, I guess, to see what kind of immune response they get out of them. And they, mm -hmm. they uh, produce like an... And so that, and that's not Ellispot anymore. Now they're using flow cytometry. Yes. Right? So where Ellispot is taking the cells, putting them on like a flat surface, <laughs> seeing the cytokines that come out in a little spot and being like, okay, that cell made those cytokines. Um flow cytometry you can do a lot more of these experiments because you're basically bottling you're sort of wrapping up the cells and saying let's look inside each cell right that yeah. flows through a very thin stream of liquid and saying does that cell have uh, what i'm looking for and in this case they're looking for all these cytokines yeah. so they flow a thin stream of cells down and they say does that cell have interferon gamma does it have tumor necrosis fat tnf alpha does it have il4 does it have il10 yeah um I mean, with the that, power of thin streams of liquid and lasers. <laughs> yeah, flow, I mean, yeah, it's amazing, actually. Flow, where the, the, it is literally looking at each individual cell and measuring its, yeah. like, amount. I mean, that's actually amazing because if you got a human to do it with a microscope, it would take them, like, a century to do what Oh, for sure, yeah. Those do. counts are, like, in, like, the 10,000s. They look at 10,000 yeah. cells, you know, like, a minute or something like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I did take a look at the extended figures, but they pretty much show the same thing as well. So they've got like an extended data figure one, which essentially shows most of the same thing that, that those data does, except like it just produces a bit more data on like the types of inter like IgG they've got more, more things on. They've got a bit of a broader spectrum, but it's almost like telling this pretty much the same story as far as I can tell. Yeah, yeah. I guess they're showing also they're they're also showing us like the difference. They're they're trying to track the change. Yes. Why light log fold change and C. Uh, yeah. So then, <clears throat> so I mean basically change from baseline uh, in terms of like the stimulation for spleenocytes. So yeah. Like, After yeah. stimulation, before stimulation. Yeah. <clears throat> and yeah, it's it's kind of a conflict, and it didn't quite come out quite well because it got a few like. Uh, transparent like uh they, yeah they've, they've got a few like dots that haven't come through very well but it, it more or less uh tells the the kind of same story of essentially it does get a th1 response which is one specific to viruses I, mm -hmm. uh, <sighs> yeah so I'm, I'm flipping through the paper because they the extended data measures are right the, the, so i'm just flipping between yeah them, for yeah. sure oh yeah i see yeah because the trans it's basically the same it's 
it's a similar way of showing the graphs, but instead of they're showing S1 and S2 in in C at least, they're using O and B. They're using the transparent circles. Yeah, they're hard to see as the two different antigens. This is yeah. all that they're looking at. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and so and those are just those are those are just two halves of the spike protein, right? So yeah. the immune response seems to be like well, one of the things you can say is that immune response is occurring across the entire protein. Um, yeah. So I think S2 is on the inside of the cells, perhaps. Like it's not on the out, right? It's not the, Yeah. it's like on the other side of the transmembrane domain. So, I mean, that just means that there is some processing of the protein intracellularly, right? It's being, yeah. it's being made in the cells and it's also being chopped up in the cells, not necessarily like stuck on the surface and then grabbed yeah. from that information. So this is part of the antigen presentation that T cells uh, do. So they do chop up cells and they present little segments of it. So knowing that mm -hmm. these, that there are many immune, like, things that cause the immune response to respond to it across all of it is quite an interesting sort of finding, especially from uh, when you want to know right. that your vaccine works, basically. Um, right. So yeah. Yeah. So so from all of that, they have some idea. Does this Chadox, you know, vector promote promote an immune response in mice? And they show that it does, and that based on seeing the different proportions of interferons and interleukins and tumor necrosis factors, that response is what you would consider appropriate for a viral infection. Um. So good enough to move on, right? Like yeah, that's good that's how move. that's how they're using the data. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's we didn't much... fail. Yeah, yeah we that's... didn't fail in mice. <laughs> I mean, yeah. To be fair, that's because they didn't have a mouse model until like yesterday, basically. <laughs> right. That's the most they could get out of mice. So yeah, yeah. So let's let's break out the monkeys. <laughs> yeah, let's break out. The... <laughs> what an amazing. <laughs> Uh, I'd watch that movie, COVID infected <laughs> monkey breakout. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking like more like a bear, you know, like the barrel of monkeys. It's just like, oh yeah, now it's, time to, now it's time to pop them open and pour them out all over the table. <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, so I mean, all those experiments were t done in the UK, as far as I can tell, and then they went to these people for in like the US to do the rhesus monkey research. Right. Yeah, because the OX in uh, Chadox is for Oxford, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I pulled that original paper where they made the um, where they where they made it. It was in 2012 hmm. was when Chadox was created. Um, and again, it was created because there was this known issue that people are immune to regular adenovirus. So like yeah. they were on the hunt for a better delivery vector. Um, I mean, and then quite... the first. Oh, sorry. Oh. I was just going to say it was it was quite interesting how like. Kind of in the ethics statement, you notice that oh, there are two different statements in there basically because the UK's laws are quite different from the America's laws. So, mm. so yeah, you've got like the the little like home office, UK home office has like given their seal of approval to this, and then the US one, they they talk about the monkeys and interesting like all the enrichment. They go into a lot more detail. They talk about they they play the monkeys' music and toys and <laughs> stuff like that, which I always like. I love reading that in papers. It just <laughs> yeah, no, they, yeah. But anyway, sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I mean, like that—that that yeah. goes to show you, like how you know all of that is—is is the difficulty in doing these animal experiments, right? Like you can, just can't throw a bunch of monkeys in a box and like no. inject them with like deadly virus. Like they do have to live like uh, somewhat. I, and this also—it's not just good ethics, right? It's also good science, yes. right? Because because you also want to be doing your science in a way that, well, like. I guess ethics and science are like highly intertwined, but I was also just thinking from the standpoint of like stress and like you want these animals to be all in like a similar unstressed condition, right? Because we know that like different levels of stress affect animals in different ways. And we don't want to be studying a model that like is like a chronically stressed animal gets an infection. <clears throat> yeah, we don't really, we don't have a study in like, oh, this vaccine only works in monkeys that are really stressed out. So like, I yeah. mean, it's, we need, it's yeah. both good ethics and good science. And it's also yeah. about stability and yeah, it's, and <clears throat> to be honest, even if it was bad science, I think we should still think about the ethics and if, yeah, that's, that yeah, well, that's, that, that's what I was saying. Like, I, I think that like, so like, that's one, that's like the in the sort of like I I love data above everything else mm. like reason for why to take care of animals, but I mean we can also say that you know animals' lives deserve to be treated with some respect, yes. right? 
that like they they are animals and you know we actually don't know that much about animal consciousness and like these like yeah. you know these monkeys are like uh they're very close to us and they have social societies and like things that we could say are very complex behaviors so yes you know like as humans like we're trying to look out for ourselves but we can't just throw this idea of like another organism's consciousness under the bus yeah. just because we don't have the right tools to understand it right we have to give them something <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh at least that's what that's what uh that's what everyone has decided on right that's what we believe as a society because I mean, that's what's embedded in our in our irb practices <clears throat> yeah that, basically yeah i think that's an important thing to always like consider i think it's like i always like to take the time to look through the ethics statements to to see if there's anything like up with them and this is actually seemed to be like yep. quite a good one um, yeah and again, the same group that did the rhesus macaque studies from previously. So, right, like we know they have the ability to take care of these animals. They have the right facilities, right, the right enrichment and, and the training in order to do these experiments. Um, and that's why we see this lab doing all of these rhesus macaque experiments, because it's like it's a lot of infrastructure to be able yeah. to put up, to be able to do this. Yeah. And we're, we're lucky to have this data. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So they do the uh, cellular and humoral immune responses. So that's the antibodies and the T cell immune responses, I guess, basically. Uh, yep. With like. Uh, ah, and... but they. But now we have a challenge model because, yes. right, we know this is the infection. So they. A is that little. I, it's like a weird way of showing it, but like that's, that's how it all happens. That's the timeline, right? Yes. 28 yeah, but... days post pre infection is either the inoculation with the chadox with the spike or chadox without the spike oh gosh and that's then... what that diagram is i understand yeah. now yeah. it's a timeline <laughs> it's a timeline <laughs> right 14 days they get a, an examination kind of like pre-infection examination and then day zero they get challenged yes um and if you guys recall from the previous one they put a lot of virus in every mode. Oh yeah, in every mode. Eyes, delivery. mouth. They they really try and hit everything with that. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's just again there was some insight because the investigator could speak for herself um, on this week in virology. She was saying, you know, these animal models are very um, valuable, right? Like yeah. you don't want to have animals go down. Like you don't want to infect animals and nothing happens. <laughs> Right. And yeah. so when they did this, they made the decision that they would go and do all the modes. Right. And, you know, this is a huge challenge in in like in science, like you're you need you want to find the results. Right. Like You want to get like to the science and the data analysis. But once you do it once in the first time, right, in your model establishment, yeah. you really don't want to change it as, as you go forward. Right. Yeah. Because what if you change it and it doesn't work that well? Right. Like, how do you justify the use of those animals to narrow down the infective route of ad administration? Right. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, we're not even really studying real disease. Remember. Right. Yeah. Like we just want to see the monkeys get some sort of like pneumonia. It doesn't matter how they get it because like these are just monkeys. They're not humans. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Because they, they are completely different. We have no way of knowing. So we have to like try everything. And then yeah. there is no guarantee yeah. that they're going to get the infection. So we, so yeah, they there is a. And what and what we're looking what we're looking for is what correlates with humans. So like yes, route of administration doesn't correlate. But if if you remember before and like again from previous literature, they get some sort of pathology in the lungs, mm. right? They shed virus. Those things like not at the same time as humans, right? Not in the same like days post infection or whatever, but they get it. And so that's like what builds our understanding of this model. <clears throat> Anyway, so then day one, three, and five, they get examined, and then day seven, they get sacrificed. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so, to do, yeah. like, a more detailed analysis of all the tissues. Yeah. Um, and I just want to remind everybody again that, like, from the infectious model from before, like, I think there's, like, a spike in day three of virus uh, yeah. post-infection. And then, actually, by day five, day seven, there's nothing anymore, mm -hmm. is how it usually works, right? And the... The initial establishment of the model took the the monkeys out to day 21, and none of them died. Right, yeah. so this is not an infectious. The, the 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 model that we're studying is not lethal for the yeah. monkeys, right? But yeah. it does replicate some of the pathology, and so there's reason to suspect that if we can see modifications to the pathology, right, in those early time points, we have something that works. We have something that's going to give us results. Yeah, uh, that, yeah. Ex exactly. Yeah, that's. Uh... 
yeah <clears> and <throat> we we do like and again they, they check the immune responses uh like like on the back day of vaccine then afterwards and they do see that there is a spike in like the uh, uh the, the, in the uh immune responses uh yep yeah um I'm losing yeah so they today. have uh, yeah, yeah so yeah yeah, so B, C, and D, they're looking at, yeah, interferon gamma again is D, right? SFU yes. per uh, spot forming units. Oh, they don't actually say directly in the. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it says, yeah, some interferon gamma L spot. Yep. So that's D. So it's the same thing that they were looking at in the mice again. They're looking first at ELISA's using just the fragments of the spike protein, um, that's antibodies. Then they're taking the serum out and they're mixing it with virus and they're infecting cells. That's BN titer. And then they're taking out cells. Well, where do they get those cells from? The if screen... they must. Oh yeah. So that's that's interesting, <laughs> right? Actually, because it... they get the oh, PBMCs they're... from blood. PBMC. So yeah. that's blood. Yeah, that's, that's blood. blood. So different from the mice, right? In the mice, they like smushed up the the, <laughs> the spleen. spleen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that was a sacrifice style. Um, yeah, whereas this was more of a, a blood taking style. So it was. This is a blood taking style. So like, not uh, you're not gonna have as sensitive, right? Because in the spleen, you have tons of the cells that are responding to this uh, immunized thing. But in the blood, the levels are gonna be lower, so your sensitivity might be lower. And you really do see that, right? That the three there's three that cluster very low, mm. right? Almost at the GFP levels. Yeah. Right? And like that could be issues of sensitivity, right? Like it doesn't mean that they're not making the things. It's that like, did the blood sample that they took have the things? Do these animals have like those circulating cells in their bloodstream? Okay. Yeah. That's <laughs> a very important thing to consider when an experiment. The limit of detection is a thing that can re really like, if, if, if an animal might be responding to the disease, but you might not be able to detect it at all because you're, mm -hmm. you're only mm -hmm. detecting a small sample of blood and it might the reaction might not be visible from there, so... Yeah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, um, yeah, so, but but they do have some high responders as well there, right? So, like, and again, if you look at the antibody response by ELISA and then sort of the functional antibody response by VN titer, all of those animals are, are exhibiting some sort of response, right, to this vaccine. Um, they are making the right antibodies to deal with, or, yeah, seemingly the right antibodies to deal with um, the... the uh, novel coronavirus <laughs> yeah and so the next figure is is quite complicated because they've got lots of experiments on in uh, figure two, in figure three uh, mm. so like the first one is looking at the clinical signs so oh, wait let's like i just want to wrap up figure two by saying so what do we know so we know how they're going about their experiments and we know that the vaccine does produce a similar immune response as they saw in the mouse Right, so they're on the right track. They've set it yeah. up that now, now we want to know. Tell us about the results, right? Like, what happens after you challenge these monkeys? <laughs> yes, that's what everyone wants to know. We want to know when this clears out. What, yes, this yeah. is the whole crux of the paper. Like, this is like kind of the yeah. The, this is probably the most important paper figure in the figure. paper. Yeah, I mean that's they're building up to it, right? They they set us up. They gave us all yeah. the information we need. They showed us it was okay and okay. So, yeah. uh, so one A is clinical score. <laughs> yes. So I, I think like I have mentioned my kind of reservations in using clinical scores alone, uh, mm. because again, clinical scores they do depend. I mean, they so they do list like the, the so there are clinical signs that, that animals do present when they are sick, but yes. there is an uh, so like things like kind of well being slow to walk around, wheezing noises, or like kind of ruffled fur, not grooming, but and mm -hmm. like yeah, they they are quite kind yeah. of useful from from perspective from like perspective of taking care of them to see which ones are are looking really bad mm -hmm. but um mm -hmm. but the problem is like there is that level of expertise in the outlook and anytime you have that there is that the the idea that the observe observer effects where people yeah. can get biased when looking at these animals and even if you are blinded to them some things can unconsciously cue you cue you in to figuring out that some there's some so it's for sure for so sure it's, so i mean and they are blinded did they blind themselves? I believe they did. Uh, uh, yeah, I think they they did blind themselves to to it. Uh, well, I mean, they blind. Well, they they allegedly blinded themselves in the Rendezvous paper. So I assume they must have. Yes. Done... Yeah. 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 That if they did it in the Rendezvous paper, they probably clinical exams were performed. Yeah. And the... was scored daily by the same person who was blinded to the study group allocations using a standardized scoring sheet. 
So if yep. someone would come there with a scoring sheet and they'd be have a list of symptoms to look out for. Uh, but I mean, and they list the ones, the clinical signs that they saw in extended data table one. Yes. Right. They have their nine animals. They have whether they were treatment, and they see what they saw. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, like, what we define as normal can vary a lot, and it's. And like in some cases, it's not too bad. Wait, but you can get things where it's accentuated. Where you, see, if you start seeing, I mean, this used to happen to me. If you start seeing more animals in one group being slightly sicker than the others, you kind of cues you into believing that to be more kind of assert, att attentive that to group. that group. Because yep. obviously, if you're caring for the animals, you want to make sure that the ones that are being sick are taken care of more. So that then you naturally. Be so it's it's a tough sure. job to actually try and like like unbiasedly <clears throat> look at these uh, these animals and and it is possible to be mis so i wouldn't say it's there it isn't meanless it's just like i wouldn't take it on its own merit on it you'd have to have multiple lines of sure uh, and that's what they do right that's just yeah, one exactly. a They're, so they show us one measure that like do the monkeys look sick <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. and and they show or and with that metric they're able to show that you know, if you're immunized with the NCoV-19 version of the Chadox vector, those animals look less sick over the days in which that they're alive. <clears throat> yeah. And so uh, but they also want to look at um, the virus that's being shed. <laughs> yeah. So BAL fluid, that's like getting down bronchular alveolar lavage getting down into those lungs with some liquid, yeah. um, Very pouring that thing. liquid out, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and seeing what's inside. I don't know if uh, you've, you've ever had that done to you, but it's not, not entirely pleasant. It's just like... Oh, no, yeah, I've never... It's, <laughs> it's absolutely awful. But And they measure it in an interesting way. They use uh, so subgenomic RNA to, to quantify like whether the virus is actually replicating. So you've got genomic RNA, which is like the whole like genome of the virus, and then some yeah. of the are parts of the virus that are like... It's, they're transcribed at the beginning of it, and they tend to transcribe more of them than... Uh, so yeah, so, like... I mean, when I saw this, I realized, I was like, wow, like, I didn't even know that, you know, they say that this is a better metric of what's replicating, mm. right? Because subgenomic is made during the infection phase, right? Like, right. If, if you're just having whole virus, like, pop out, right? Like, that's not the same as, like, virus actively being made in cells, Mm. Um, and it maybe well, I was like, wow, like I love that this group did this because again, like it again shows even if they aren't different, right? It's showing that they're looking at two different scenarios mm. within the model to try to give us a better picture of what's going on. Um, and they didn't do that in the original study. Um, and they were actually using different primers too. So like also in the original model, like these types of these analyses are not the same mm. as the analyses before. They were using the yeah, anyways, they were using ORF7 in the original model, and then here they use the E protein, which we talked about with MERS. That's the envelope, or yeah, the envelope. It's inside of the membrane. Yeah. Um, highly conserved. It doesn't really uh, disappear in in these viro viruses. Um, and and subgenomic uh, being that, so like genomic is, they just look at the some little piece inside of the E gene, but mm. subgenomic, when... Uh, so, like, the genome is made of RNA, right? Right. <laughs> I guess that's what to remember, right? Yeah. The genome is made of RNA, and that RNA, the, in addition to having to make, um, having held all the gen genetic information for this virus, it also has to make proteins. Mm. <laughs> and so subgenomic is those, like, truncated versions where it takes, like, a leader sequence, right? That's what they show in this one. It's, like, a leader sequence that sort of says, start, start translating me, and then the, the protein itself. Yeah. Um, and that happens with the RNA polymerase um, of this particular virus. It's able to like jump around the genome. And so subgenomic, they use primers, one on the leader and one in the gene, right? And so it makes it makes a product that wouldn't exist unless that truncated version of the of of the E protein is in the cell, right? Yeah, <clears throat> and, and that's fascinating. That's something I didn't like get from. It took me a while to get my head around that, but the fact that like yes, yeah, that yes, again I. For people who want to follow along, I pulled down some papers. <laughs> I pulled down the papers that they referenced into the into the Zotero talking about that. So like it's um, yeah, they go into a little bit more detail. But also I think oh yeah no, it's not in this extended figure. One of the extended figures in the papers shows that truncated version that they're looking for in subgenomic RNA. 
<clears throat> but I managed to put those in the. I, yeah, I don't think I managed to put the that twenty the figure in. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't think. No, it's not in this paper. It was in. It was in when they referenced the methods. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's one of those. It's like it was like I I looked for the methods and then in the extended figures of the methods was that truncated version <laughs> that they were looking at. Oh, so gosh, you yeah, know. I think I, they it was a nature paper and I was reading the nature paper and then oh yeah the, yes. oh, the methods are always in the uh, supplementary. <laughs> nature papers yes. never do the methods in the yes. paper. And, That's right. It was, it so, was yeah, a nature. Okay. Clinical translation science or something. Yeah. Um, uh, but so they look at bowel and they also look at nose swabs. Mm. Um, that's kind of interesting, right? Like they actually, it's still in the nose more than it is in the, in the BAL fluid. Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, the, again, I mean, you, you might, may or may not expect that depending on, so I think like in the original course that there wasn't, was it so much in the nose or was it like tend to be in the lung? I think it. Oh, you mean in the original model? Sorry, in the original, like, kind of un, unlike biased model. Where, I mean, I think, because, I mean, it's, because, because I could just say that it's quite easy to say, oh, you put it in the nose, it stays there, so there's naturally going to be more in the nose than the lungs, but... Yeah, for sure, for sure. But then, uh, like, if, sometimes, like, you get things that grow very, so it could, there could be a genuine change in, 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 the, in the lungs here, but, um... I mean, it this what the sh the stuff that they show is in line with the previous with the original model in the sense that no swab showed virus like out until day sixteen it looks like um, from the original model and the RNA in the BAL like showed was or there was actually they don't go out that far <laughs> they didn't in the original model they didn't BAL out to seven days yeah. Um, but it was it was high throughout. So like the intervention is lowering, right, in the BAL, but it's not lowering as much in the nose. Yeah, that's I can see why this would be contentious because the nose is an important pop, like part of transmission, and you want to. Yes. Vaccine it, uh, yes. You'd want to. But, but again. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean that's interesting. Like that's also that's also when you look at clinical endpoints. What is your vaccine doing? Right. Like, yeah. like, is the point of the vaccine when when you do a clinical trial, you have to choose the endpoints. The endpoints are going to be like probably mortality in the hospital. Right. Like you can't take you can't choose an endpoint that says transmission. That's a really hard endpoint to say, like, we yeah. want a vaccine that, you know, gives you the sterilizing immunity. That means like no transmission. Oh, and I think that's the that's another endpoint you could use. You could say sterilizing immunity. Right. Yeah. We want a vaccine that means no virus ever. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, and th those are possible, but I mean, not necessarily for coronavirus. And some for some species of virus, they aren't. I mean, I think <clears> that for whooping yep. cough, they they mostly go for having a much less uh, severe oh, yeah. pneumonia. So yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, and like the funny thing is, and for whooping cough too, I love the I love this whooping cough example. But like that vaccine is against a toxin, right? Yeah. The, or an, an attachment factor that that bacteria has. So then like over time, like you see evolution and like yeah. there are strains now that like just don't, they still can infect you, but they just don't have that toxin, right? Yeah. The toxin, you, you don't get the disease. You can't but, um, to evolve to coexist. Uh, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so like that's, I think that's important to remember with vaccines is that like, like of course we would love a vaccine that gave us 100% sterilizing immunity in yeah. every person, but that may not be the reality of getting one of these vaccines, yeah. right? The reality may be just like we're we're keeping people out of the hospital, right? Like, yeah. like you get this vaccine and now it's not a severe disease, and and realistically, that's actually pretty good because if if the vaccine like means no severe disease whatsoever, like no time spent in the hospital, then what does it matter that you get it in the environment? Right. Like we pushed it into this. Right. Like if it's just like, oh, I'm out for a few days, I'm kind of sniffly. Yeah. Right. Again, like I'd love to see that efficacy then against our highest risk population. Right. Yeah. That it, it, in that case, then it would mean a lot that that study included a lot of high risk individuals mm. that didn't get the disease. Right. Because I wouldn't want to see like a study being done in the healthy individuals. OK, they don't get a disease, but they still have high loads of the virus because that just means that like that that vaccine is going to punish those people who, who do get severe disease, yeah. right? Because everyone's going to be like, oh, I'm fine. Like, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I've been vaccinated and you're still like spreading it out to all those people that it doesn't have any efficacy to. But again, we, we won't know that until we see it tried in a human trial, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and again, it's quite difficult to quantify like whether pneumonia has happened or not, because again, you, you can't really, it's again, very difficult to kind of, the definition is very woolly when you're looking at animals. To the point where, mm -hmm. like, 
a pathologist can see like the same X-ray, an X-ray of the same animal, come to to somewhat di different conclusions. Uh, right. I think we saw that. We're in... not... Sorry. Oh yeah. Yeah, we're gonna. We saw that in the... Go, go ahead, please. Oh no, yeah, about... I was gonna start in that. <laughs> we did see that in the missing episode, but we don't need to go into that. We, I, I, I do notice that our time is coming a bit low. And oh sure, yeah. Um, I just want to say that, and we're not even looking at disease right now in these two in B and C, right? We're yeah. looking at viral load. <laughs> yeah. So, so like, it's, it's not even telling us like, are these animals really sick, right? Like, are they getting pneumonia? It's just, do they have a lot of virus? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, we've, I mean, the, the, the symptoms is like, can tell us whether they look sick. The, the, this one tells us that they have a lot of, well, the, the, the one, the, there is a reduction in the amount of virus we were seeing when the vaccinated ones, which mm -hmm. is good. Uh, and in the uh, uh, other one, we learned, looking at the kind of where the, where it is in the lobes, it, 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 the thing is that the virus does seem to still be there, and the lungs just seems to be a, a bit lower. Yeah. Um, so it's. I mean, at least in some individuals, right? It's like in yeah. this even in this very small group, some of the monkeys still have. Right. I mean, if, if we say SG subgenomic RNA is the most strict test, yes. right, to know that virus is actively replicating in in these animals, there's still one <laughs> monkey in the cohort that has activating virus after this after this uh, vaccine. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, right, like that. Extracting out that percentage wise could be like, oh, well, you know. Right, right. And, and I think, again, going back to, so yeah, that's D, going back to C, like even in SGRNA, um, in the nose swabs, you see that the group is split yeah. in the vac vaccinated group, right? Like there are some that have virus still and there are some that don't. Yeah. Um, and again, maybe it's fine because maybe the monkeys aren't getting sick, right? Like that's maybe one of the things that could be said. Look at A, they're not getting sick though. So like, it's fine. They can have the virus. Well, I mean, this is but about it. The, the, this, the idea of the way that it's represented, the idea that there is like an average infection in different groups, except there are different, it's different courses. So there are going to be different subgroups that are going to be represented. So, yeah, yeah. So you trying to like uh, do normal statistics with like the mean is, or like they use a geometric mean here because they're operating across multiple logs of, of kind of what the number of viruses. And it's very different because, mm -hmm. I mean, d diseases take different paths through, through infection. So, uh, so different mon monkeys might have quite different responses. They not, and ones uh, yeah. ha might not necessarily be. Com I mean, what you might be seeing here is the difference between the healthier and severe groups, or just different subtle things that are changing the their immune response. So I mean, absolutely. And it's <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, like like we don't know how these dots map up to the to extended table one, right? Where they kind of look at some of those those actual clinical progressions. And let's look at like so I'm gonna I'm looking at extended uh, data table one right now, and I'm looking at all the vaccine monkeys, and there are there is one monkey whoa that has tachypnea all the way out to day six. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but there's also groups that have tachypnea versus dyspnea. Yeah. So right, like shortness of breath versus quickened breath. So like it, that's a different type of disease, you know, manifestation. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's, right? And yeah, like, yeah. I, there's a real potpourri of <laughs> disease, like sort of phenotypes here. I would say two, maybe two phenotypes, um, and then there is one that's that lasts longer than the other, right? Yeah. So like a subtype that lasts longer. I mean, um, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> this is a kind of the peril of trying to pull pull a disease into one dot on a graph because <laughs> they are so much more complicated than that. And so I think it is good that they did present the actual individual symptoms so we can look at them. I mean, yeah. Like, even though, in in my opinion, that I think, like, yeah, even though I think that that those sorts of things can be subject to bias, but I think they can still be informative if you t keep that in mind when you look at them. Sure, because, sure. Because there are some things that you can't necessarily fix. Like, you can't. Well, say, I mean, yeah. Just because it's subject to bias, like that, just puts you know, like in my mind, I'm just like, there's a probability this is incorrect. That's kind of how I apply it. Right. I mean, There's I a probability of... that they like fudged it in the certain direction. But uh, at the same time, like they did see a difference between yeah. these two things. Right. Like especially shortness of breath versus quickened breath. 
Definitely. Like, I can't imagine, like, that being something that someone was like, you know, like, oh, I, I saw these monkeys. I, I think they're all shortness of breath. Like, they had the whole group in front of them to look, yeah. right, as they went through it. And so that's something. That that could be a disease differentiating thing, indicating there might have been two courses going on here, right, yeah. that could be played out in the viral titers as well. Yeah. Again, I mean, these are really small data sets. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, like, the, you can fudge it, but there is only so much time you can fudge. I mean... A monkey yep. that has diarrhea is going to look very different from a monkey that doesn't have have diarrhea. Or so there. Are, so I mean, right. you can like kind of when it comes to the very subtle differences, that's where you should be. But when it's, like, when it's like really big differences, then you can sort of understand that okay, that might not be a subject of bias. Like you can't like, right. yeah. Um, so that was right. all I was going to say. Um, because I mean, yeah, the difference between like a normal uh animal and a one is dysp dyspnea with like abdominal elf effort, where like people like breathing through their stomach. They're like kind of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's. Uh... And 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 I think the other thing I want to bring our attention to, right, is what are we using this data for? Like, mm. why did we collect this data, right? And it's it's preclinical data that's telling us should we go into humans, right? Yeah. Like, does this warrant a stab in in phase one clinical trials? Right. Um, at the end of the day, like that's what we're trying to use this data for. And 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 so and so seeing this, I can see why there was controversial, right? Because because people would want to see more promising stuff from the animal, right? Yeah. They would like to see like very definitive evidence that the animals were better. <laughs> and yeah. maybe it's not as definitive as people would have liked, but it doesn't mean that it's still not promising at some level and again this comes down to very difficult decisions yeah. from the right like it's a difficult decision to go from mice into monkeys in some ways yeah. right because of the increased cost and an even more difficult decision to then go from animals into humans right that yeah. jump um and having multiple ways of arguing for that decision to to do that trial like is what this data is ultimately going to help us understand and then maybe in the future too, like someone could go back and see something cool and they want to follow up mechanistically on it, right? Yeah. On the basic side and, and kind of dive into that. That would be really interesting to see as well. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there's one last figure of the histology where they show like some slides of like lungs that basically demonstrate that there is some pneumonia going on. Well, some bacteria infection going on. Uh, mm, but ba yeah, bacterial I, infection. Oh, no, sorry. No, no. Uh, viral, viral. viral infection. God. Viral. But it's but it's exudate like pneumonia in this sense. It's not like your lungs are filled up with virus that's killing you. I, I would hope people know now, right? Like that's immune exudate is yes. what's causing this pneumonia, right? Those air spaces in your lungs, they're very thin. Um, when the inflammation happens and immune cells want to rush in there and, and eat up all the virus, well, they take up space. And so yeah. now you've got a very crowded space with all these immune cells and there's no space for the air. Um, and that's what's giving you that ARDS. You know, like this is what we're trying to prevent. Like we would like to not see such a crazy immune response. Yeah. Um, so I mean, like that to, to me, that's that that also speaks to what is an important endpoint. You know, like do it, seeing all these animal studies and stuff. Like we're also coming to a better understanding of the disease itself, mm. right? And like, what is a good endpoint to choose? Right. Like, I mean, of course, clinical yeah. endpoints are very important, but could there be like a nice molecular endpoint that we could look at, like number of infiltrating cells in yeah. BAL? Oh, God, they have to BAL all the human. <laughs> that sounds but, really difficult. But things like pre preventing, <sighs> I mean, for different diseases, it'd be like preventing septicemia or looking at mm -hmm. kind of immune responses in the blood or like kind of watching to see what things are um, Maybe like an endpoint could be like filling the lung, the filling volume, right? The tidal volume or whatever. Like yeah. how much air can you get into your lungs? Um, yeah. I know that that's a very laborious piece of data to collect, but it speaks closer to this scenario, right? Like yeah. is the vaccine helping people like uh, prevent <laughs> pneumonia, prevent any sort of respiratory related um, symptoms? <clears throat> yeah. And, that's, and uh, yeah, looking at this study, I mean... The, yeah, I can feel. I can see why people are equivocating over the results. Where like, because it it shows an effect, but I do also think that the kind of context matters here. The fact that we are in the middle of a, a massive pandemic. Yeah, and absolutely. So has and it has moved on to phase one trials. Yes, right? it has. I yeah. think it, yeah, I think it was like almost in phase one trials, like at the same time as this. No, at no, the same sorry. time as this came out. I feel like yeah, because there was a lot. There was a big push for volunteers for Chadox like quite a, earlier in the year. And, gotcha. 
yeah, mm-hmm. I get the feeling that that if this was like a less severe disease, people might not have taken the plunge. But because it's COVID, because like any sort of risk thing that helps is something that we really want to pre- prevent. And sure. it's almost like throwing shit against the wall and seeing that if anything can help we want we want something that we can yeah push. but but i mean not <laughs> i would say like it's not really throwing shit against the wall because like they've done all of this stuff leading yes. up to it right True. it's just that like <laughs> yeah like they're just willing to take a little bit of a flex maybe um because of the times but i'm not even sure if that's that it, it is a flex because again these are not this is not human disease, right? Mm-hmm. Phase one, like if it's safe in humans, and again, like it's this rationale that there's a fear that the the action, the adenovirus one that is in phase one, it's not going to be effective in a certain percentage of the population, right? Um, and actually, the the phase one trial that they did, I added this one too. It's Zoo 2020. They look very much at pre-existing neutralizing antibodies to the vector. <laughs> like that was one of their major data points is trying to figure out like is there a immune reaction to this because if there is then like we don't want to move forward with it yeah um and and with the chimpanzee adenovirus you don't have to worry about that because all of that data is actually done already right like that there was a lot of validation already to see that there isn't a big uh immune response to this adenovirus the focus will be more on the efficacy and the safety um Yeah, the clinical efficacy or whatever efficacy endpoints they ch- they choose. <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah, no. Fair. I mean, I think we've. I mean, is there anything else you'd like to add on this as well? Um, no. I mean, I think that this is like this is, you know, there's a huge plethora of <laughs> vaccines that are being done, and it's good to be able to talk about how they differ from each other. Yeah. And and seeing that like, um, seeing that immunity is not just like oh. <laughs> A monolithic concept like immune not immune right like there's several things going uh coming at play here um in the human and furthermore scientists trying to understand what that immunity will look like is is further convoluted through the lens of the models that they're using right and like between like animals and yeah between mice and monkeys yeah I think that's been illustrated I mean this paper even illustrates it changes within mice as well so I mean it's Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's really nice from that yeah like diving into this paper can really help you appreciate right that complex landscape of of the work being done and ultimately realize that people are trying many different things to get at a vaccine right and and we don't know what's going to work everyone's trying their best in their own like kind of little discipline knowledge understanding yeah yeah i think this paper does i mean it does do a good job of like showing the variation because I think that's very important, like understanding how, because yeah, I mean the aver- the averages only tell you so much. It's the variation and the kind of the different parts a, a disease can take, and mm-hmm. I feel that that was appreciated. And it is just, it is kind of, I mean, I feel like the results are more honest because they seem messy rather than less. I feel like absolutely, that. absolutely. I, I mean, I appreciate the data that this paper is bringing to the table, and the fact that this data now exists, it also means it can be looked at as a correlate to how the human trials go, right? Yes. That like now, like once the human trials go through, now we have a correlate in monkeys to try to say, okay, well, it behaved this way in monkeys. Do we have reason to believe if we did monkeys a different, if we had a different sort of a vaccine to try in monkeys? could we see that the correlate going on into humans? Maybe, right? Like, I, I just think that, like, fleshing out the picture is, is the important part here. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's, I think we, I mean, I've said all I can really say about this paper. Yeah, so. yeah no, I'm happy. I, yeah. I think it was, uh, I was, I enjoyed learning about <laughs> this uh, Chadox um, vector. Yeah, the, <laughs> the Chadox vaccine. Uh, <laughs> uh, so hopefully it'll, it'll work out in the end, but, um, Thank you so much for joining me and for uh, talk for talking about me with this paper, so we can both geek out about vaccines. So it's yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> it's been a lot of fun, and hopefully uh, the viewers will join us next week for when we do our run run out of microbiology news and then our paper nominations. But mm-hmm. yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'll hopefully see you next week. Bye bye.